Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve sallallahu ve sellem ala khatimel enbiya'i ve mursalin. Seyyidena Muhammed ve alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in ve ba'd. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is again a great privilege for me uh, to be with you tonight. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take these few moments and make them uh, as part of our hasanat on the day of judgment. And that Allah would forgive us for our shortcomings. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, uh, friends, guests, we are living in very crucial times. And many of the decisions that we are making today will have profound influence upon our families and the world that we are living in. And Muslims in particular need to have basira, need to have the ability to look at events not only on the surface, but to begin to look through the surface inside of what is actually happening. And the best way that we can do that is to constantly return to our sources, to Al-Wahi, to the revelation, to what has been revealed by the creator of the heavens and the earth, and to what was given to the last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The political systems of the world have failed us. Socialism has failed. The capitalism is failing. Tribalism, nationalism, all the different isms and schisms that have plagued the Muslim world and the oppressed people throughout the planet have failed in bringing about unity and love and cooperation and the type of a world that we could live in as human beings, live a good existence with our fellow human beings and pass through this world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with over a hundred thousand followers in his last sermon, his Arafat sermon, laid down important principles. He made it clear to the believers that there is nothing worthy of worship but Allah, but the creator of the heavens and the earth, that he is the last messenger, and that all of their business dealings, all of their economic dealings done in ignorance should be abolished that they should not involve themselves in oppression in any way. That there is no preference for, for Arabs over non-Arabs, or non-Arabs over Arabs. There is no preference, no higher place for white over black, or black over white. But that taqwa, piety and right action, this is the only uh, thing that, should, that separates people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also told us that men have rights over women, but women also have rights over men. And that the evil one has despaired of being followed in the Arabian Peninsula. Beware of him in other lands. That he would attack you in small affairs. And he told us very clearly, I have left you two things. If you follow these two things, you will never go astray. And that is the book of Allah and his sunnah. And so we seek refuge in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us the bottom line, who has given us the ultimate communication between creator and created. And Allah has told us very clearly in his book, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem Ya ayyuha alladheena amunu attaqu allaha wa kunu ma'asadiqeen O oh, you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah and be with the truthful. <coughs> and our scholars have shown us that a sidq is not only truth in words, but the heart should confirm what we say. And the limbs should practice that which we believed in and that which we confirmed in our heart and that which we said. We should practice what we preach. And so the truthful ones are not only those who claim to be on the right path, 
but those who are actually doing the work of those who are on the right path. Those who have humbled themselves to the Creator, who are not arrogant to other people, who are not filled with racism and classism and tribalism, and who are ready to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has also blessed us with the last messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, who did not speak from himself. But he spoke from revelation. And what he gave us in his authentic hadith is a direct message from Allah through a human being to us that we could also benefit from this. And when he spoke to the Sahaba, he not only spoke to them concerning their affairs, but he spoke to them concerning times that would come in the future. And in one hadith which is reported by Imam al-Suyuti and al-Jami al, al sagir Abu Huraira radiallahu an reports that the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him said, Yakunu fi akhir zaman dajjalun kathabun ya'tunakum min al-ahadith bima lam tasma'u antum wa la aba'ukum fa iyyakum wa iyyahum la yudillunakum the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, There would come in the end of time great liars, kathabun, dajjalun, to the point where they are false Christs, claiming to be false prophets, would lead you astray. And they will come to you with a type of speech that you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray. Beware that they put you into a fitna, a trial, and a, tempta and a temptation. And so the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, did not speak from himself. And we are witnessing today, with the advent of the new technology, that human beings have the ability to send information throughout the planet simultaneously. We have the ability to witness events here in Australia that could be happening in other parts of the world. In Europe, we could witness these events. But at the same time, we can be confused simultaneously. The whole world can be lied to at once. And they have the ability to twist around, to, to develop, to put together images and sounds and to develop this story which although it is not true appears to be true and, and, and you know it's not true but you watch it as though it is true and it affects the way you think and so as the Prophet peace be upon him said Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam they will come to you with a type of speech that you nor your parents have ever heard of before. You have never heard this thing before. Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. As a young American growing up in North America, mainly of African American heritage, I began to look for my roots, to look into my family, to try to connect this with what I was seeing on the television and what I was being given in the educational system. And one of my grandparents was a native, as you would call the aboriginals, you would say it here in Australia. One of my grandparents was an aboriginal person in North America. And they told us that the Indians, and that's the first lie, because Columbus was lost, and he bumped into America and he called it in India. He thought he was an India. So he called the people Indians. But they told us and showed us in films that the Indians were a savage people. And they were always attacking the wagon trains. They were always killing their enemies and they were even scalping their enemies. And you'll be surprised to know that the first scalping was done by extremists amongst the European settlers. They were the first to scalp. And as a reaction to this, the native people began to take their scalps. But it comes to you in a totally different way. They also told us that Columbus discovered America. 
that he discovered these lands as though there is nobody living here. But when you read the writings of Ferdinand Columbus, his son, and he was the one who, who stepped on the mainland. Columbus never stepped on the mainland. He only touched the islands. But when Ferdinand wrote about Mexico, he said he found a massive city as large as anything in Europe with hanging gardens, with pyramids, with all the trappings of civilization. And when the conquistadores went south to Peru, they found in the Inca civilization, they found high intelligence and they found amongst the people of the south calendars that were similar to the ancient Egyptian calendars. They found astronomy, technology, all types of science and knowledge. When they went nor north into North America, they found highly organized people. Amongst the Cherokee Nation, there were cities of over 100,000 people with three-story buildings. We don't hear this. They also found the Iroquois Confederacy, and it was the agreement made between the Iroquois Nation that was the basis of the United States Constitution. They don't tell you that. They don't tell you what they found in the Americas. And after that, a genocide occurred. And so by saying they discovered America, they own America, they own these lands, they tried to justify the mass murder that took place in millions of the native peoples from South America to Central to North America were wiped out through the killing of, of their stock by giving them blankets filled with deadly diseases that they had no cures for. And so they died by the hundred thousands and even the millions. But we hear stories about the cowboys and the Indians and it gives you a totally different picture and they make it seem so true that you get confused and they go so far even to name their baseball teams after the people they have killed and put in reservations. And so they have a type of speech, a way to twist the truth and reality that we have never seen before in a civilization. To the African Americans, to our people, they told us that we are free. And after the so-called freedom, we couldn't find jobs. We couldn't find decent places to live. We could not find education. And so it reached the point, up until now, when you see this beautiful image of America, the reality is totally different. And you will be surprised to know that one in every four African Americans will go to jail at one point in his life. 25% will enter the prison. You will be surprised to know that of 8 million people who are in jail, in prisons, incarceration internationally, that 2 million people are incarcerated inside of the United States alone. There are more people in jail than there are in universities and colleges. And you'll be shocked when you go inside these institutions and see people in some cases that had nothing to do with crimes inside of the institutions and inside there for life. And one of the secrets we found is that people in a maximum security prison were making clothing, they were making running shoes and, and, and jeans and they were only being paid about 50 cents an hour. And so you have thousands of people, many of them in jail for life, working for 50 cents an hour so what you have is a modern slave state another form of slavery which is done in the name of freedom and justice and they will come to you with the type of speech that you nor your parents have never heard of before and then we look at the Muslim world and we see in the past 50 years we see gen massive genocides taking place. We see Palestinians driven out of their land. We see people throughout Africa living under tyrants financed 
by industrialized nations. We see wholesale murder and genocide. And now with technology, you even see the bodies of the people in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Kashmir. You see it with your own eyes. We witnessed this being slaughtered all over the planet. Thousands of people mercilessly being killed. And then September 11th, an event that took place that with the use of technology, with people's minds being connected together by the electronic technology, it becomes a worldwide event. And no doubt it was a horrendous event. But there are also horrendous events that took place in Rwanda and Cambodia and Vietnam and in other parts of the world. And so the September 11th took place. And we as Muslims watched this thing happen. And we said, no, don't let them blame this on us. They blamed Oklahoma City on us. Only by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some information got out. And they realized it wasn't a Middle Eastern character. That it was one of their own right-wing Johnny Appleseeds. One of their own homeboys who carried it out. But this event took place. And we did not, I want to make it categorically clear. We did not enjoy this event. It is not an Islamic event. And you will be surprised to know that there is a masjid. There was a masjid in the trade center, in, in, in the Twin Towers. Over 1,500 people used to make Salat al -Jumar. And we know that if 1,500 people made Juma, how many didn't make the Salat? You know our community. So that means there were thousands of Muslims inside of that building who also perished. And up until now, we have received no conclusive evidence, only circumstantial evidence, but nothing conclusive. And, and, and they tell us that these young Arabs carried this thing out. And then we saw in Saudi Arabia, some of the people actually came, their name was on the list, and they went to the embassy and said, I'm alive. I didn't do it, man. I'm right here. Okay? No. Then they say, no, they carried it out, and these so-called religious extremists, before they do it, they're drinking alcohol the night before, getting drunk, and then they're going to sacrifice themselves for Allah. He writes a letter which so conveniently is found, and then it says, uh -uh, Bismillah wa bismi nafsi wa ailati, in the name of Allah, in the name of myself, in the name of my family. This, nobody writes like this. This is a strange situation. And then the building is, it falls down and destroyed and insinuated, and they find the passport. <laughs> they find the passport, man. So we're saying, what is the reality of this situation? Why are we being blamed for this? Why is a confusion happened when people are, 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 are made guilty before they are even taken to court? And every human being is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And then the whole of the Muslim world suffers. People who have nothing to do with the Middle East, nothing to do with any of this are suffering behind this. But at the same time, we begin to see the climax of a major change in society. The climax of a new world order. And we begin to see a type of integration between information technology and trade. We begin to see the economy politics, culture, and ideology being transported simultaneously from nation to nation. And with this technology, with the ability to transport ideas, the very value systems of people, the way that they eat, what they enjoy to do, how they enjoy recreation, their racial concepts, their culture, their ideology, being transported all around the world, a type of globalization. And with this boom in the information technology, 
And with this major event that takes place, now it comes to a culmination and it starts to reach a high point. And so with the innocent people, we look at this and we say, what is going on? What is happening to the world that had so many different varying views, different nations, different ways of approaching things that can complement each other? Now we see politics is stripped of real power, that the economy governs all social exchange. We see that the states serve the financial powers, power structures, that the real power is no longer in the hands of the generals, but the real power now switching to the hands of the people who run the economy, to the banking systems. And then we see that politicians play the role of public relations offices only to control the masses, either by lulling them to sleep or by terrorizing them. And then we see that the masses of the people become helplessly preoccupied. Their lives are now bombarded with a series of cultural events. And these cultural events start to become the most important things in their lives. The World Cup, the Major League Series, the rugby, the cricket, the hockey, the tennis, whatever the sport may be, we see whole nations coming behind sports and the national heroes become sporting people, even in Saudi Arabia. Even in our own Muslim countries, the national heroes are now the soccer players. Who kicks the little ball inside of a net? He becomes the hero of the nation when people are dying on the ground. But yet we become preoccupied with this. And it becomes a type of indoctrination happening to us. And with the use of powerful music playing on our emotions, with videos now being taken to the furthest extremes in the planet. People's thinking processes are changing. People are now in love with the superheroes, even confused about their own identity, trying to change themselves, change the color of their hair, change their eyes, change the way they dress, change the way they talk on a global level. And then we see drug addiction reaching a point that humanity has never seen before. And after traveling to over 36 countries, looking at the Muslims and being with them, I have found that in all of the communities that the young people are, are being confused with drugs. It is pouring into our countries. No matter what form it takes, cocaine, LSD, psychedelic, depressants, put you up, put you down, confuse you but create a false world and give you a false dependence so that you become dependent on the chemical. You forget about Allah. Your God becomes the pusher. Your God becomes the chemical. And so creating this dependency amongst the masses of the people. And then we see lethal social diseases being spread. And it is said that in Southern Africa, and Allah knows best what this really is, but they say that in some parts of Southern Africa, one out of every four people is HIV positive. It has reached this level. Now, whatever this HIV is, there's a lot of theories. Whether it is some germ warfare, whether it is something passed through homosexuality, whether it is a type of corruption, what some doctors have even said is that your immune system can break down by a number of factors. Not only a virus that they had never really located and shown us what it looks like, but the immune system can break down from malnutrition, from tuberculosis, from forms of malaria. And they've listed almost 40 ways that your immune system can break down and if you take a test, you will be considered HIV positive. But whatever it is, it's killing us. It's killing us in large numbers. Then we see the planet malfunctioning. We're supposed to be rising 
in technology our life is supposed to be getting better but the very planet that is created in order to serve us is malfunctioning the air is becoming polluted the water is becoming polluted the animals are dying they are cutting down the rainforests they are destroying forms of life and now we are getting strange forms of cancer other diseases other lumps and, and tumors and things popping up in our bodies that we have never seen before and it is happening all over the planet and so what is happening in front of us when people begin to speak out when they try to protest what is going on even in a legal way they are protesting they find themselves either swamped with false information coming out of the technology or they find themselves terrorized they find themselves in a state of fear and so when the events happen as September 11th the world changes those who are connected to the electronic technology are put into a state of fear and images are being placed in front of their eyes as the images were before and these images are connected to the geopolitical situation don't be fooled why do you think back in the, in, in the 60s we still had um, the remnants of the bad guys coming from World War II Japanese Germans Russians why do you think that coming into the 80s and 90s Spanish drug cartels Afro-American gangs and the most sinister character you can bring to the screen the Arab terrorist he seizes his hostages and he will not release them until you release his comrades from the jail this is before September 11th before that day Chuck Norris was chasing us Arnold Schwarzenegger Steven Seagal all of the so-called folk heroes are chasing around this image we were being prepared for something our minds were being prepared for something this does not happen by chance and we the innocent people trying to look at the world and trying to understand what is going on we see everything is moving toward one world state one world police force one world bank and one world unelected elite that rules over us not based upon the will of the people or democracy but rules over because of control of the bank control of the economy and the flow of the money which is changing every day changing from gold and silver to paper to plastic and now they are trying out chips they're putting chips in somebody's head they tried it in Florida and if you can take anything from me don't ever let anybody put a chip inside of you don't let them do it to you man a microchip and they say no it can do you a lot of good if you have if you're diabetic it will say you're diabetic and then they showed us this picture they show us this movie or, or, or this commercial how this chip can play itself out and there's an old woman inside of the store and she's shopping in the store and the young guy is next to her stealing things he's putting it in her clothes in, in his clothes and she says oh my god he's stealing and he fills his clothes with food and items and he runs out the store and, and the old woman is in shock and then the attendant the clerk runs behind the man and says you forgot your receipt <laughs> you forgot your receipt he had a chip inside of him and when he went through that barrier it recorded his bank account the money that, 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 was, that, that he took out the store everything simultaneously uh, happened and then she said you forgot your receipt what a beautiful world it would be what a beautiful world but the problem we're facing is what else can happen with that chip what else can be done to the chip your emotions could be controlled your mind could be controlled you could even be killed well in the earlier decades people wrote about this George Orwell wrote about you saw 1984 you saw people talking about animal farms talking about Big Brother they wrote about this before now it is coming to pass 
And there are so many theories about this. We are bombarded with this. We see people talking about the Freemason order, the Illuminati, the international bankers, the Zionists, alien consciousness. Even some groups are coming up, satanic type groups, new age type religions. All of these coming up and what we find in most cases is that all of these groups are worshipping a force. If you go to the highest level of these groups, you see they are doing a type of worship. It is not to God. It is not the God of Moses or Jesus or Muhammad, peace be upon them. It is another force. And they are worshipping this force. They are seeking and taking strength out of this force. And nobody can say exactly what it is. But Muslims have the bottom line. And Allah has told us, قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُ وَزَاهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا The truth has come. And falsehood will vanish. Because surely falsehood is a perishing, vanishing thing. And so the Quran and the, and the Hadith, the revelation gives the Muslim the bottom line. And we need to work from the bottom line up. Instead of from the confusion to the bottom line. And when we go to the bottom line, we find that the Qur'an talks about in the beginning of time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the creations, and then He created Adam alayhi salam. And He turned to His angels, and amongst the angels was a jinni named Iblis. May Allah protect us from him. There was a jinni amongst them, who was so pious and so knowledgeable, he was given a place with the angels. The angels could not disobey Allah. And so Allah told them in the, in the oft-repeated verses, Usjudu li Adam fasajadu illa Iblis. He told them, bow down to Adam. And all of them bow down is except Iblis. And Surah Al-Kahf told us, Kana min al-jinn. He was jinni. He was not a fallen angel. He refused to bow down. Why did he not bow down? You made me from fire and you made him from clay. Arrogance and pride. And you could say he was a racist. He was the first racist because he didn't want to accept Adam. Not because of anything that he or Adam did, but because merely of the creation of Adam alayhi salam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed him and sent him down and promised him hellfire. But the shaitan will iyadu billah asked for respite. He asked for a chance to come to the creation. And he made it clear and the Quran tells us very clearly that he said, I will come around them on their right side, on their left side, above them. I will make them change the creation of Allah. And in one of the verses, and there are so many, so much truth which is in front of us, if we would read this book, not just to read, read it for the knowledge, read it for the guidance in the world that we are living in today. And it tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah tells us, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا وَلَا تَتَّبِيُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّوءِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ and so Allah told us, O oh people, eat from the earth that which is permissible and wholesome, that which is good, and do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. For he is to you an open enemy. Verily, he will command you with immorality and evil, sexual immorality, and he will also command you to say about Allah that which you know not. In another verse, Allah tells us, Ashaytan ya'idukum al faqa wa ya'murukum bil fahsha. That He will threaten you with poverty and He commands you with immorality, with corruption. He commands you with this. And so we see certain themes. Put these themes in your mind when you think about the international system. What are the foundations of the system that we are all living under? 
the fear of poverty, evil, corruption. And then we see also in Surah Al Ma'idah, Allah tells us, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, innam al khamru wal maysiru wal ansabu wal azlam, rijsun min amal ash shaytan, fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. Innama yuridu ash shaytanu an yuqi abaynakum al adawa wal baghda fi al khamri wal maysir, wa yasuddukum min dhikrillah wa anis salat, fahal antum muntahun. Allah tells us, O you who believe, surely intoxicants and gambling and sacrificing at the idols and telling the fortune with arrows, all of this is an evil abomination from the work of the devil. Stay away from it in order that you would be successful. Surely the shaitan wants to put in between you hatred and animosity by using intoxicants and gambling and to block you from the remembrance of Allah and from your salat, from your prayers. So will you not then stop? Allah tells us, won't you stop? But what did the evil one put in front of us? Look at the categories that are in front of us. Evil. Go to the movie and see. The hero of half the, of the movies is a criminal. The thieves and the bandits are now the heroes that people, young people especially, are idolizing. Look at the music. Look at the expression coming out of the anarchy and the music in the younger generation. Then look at now the world. Immorality. And then you see it in the movies, you see it in the programs. And some of our own Muslims are watching Especially sisters are watching during the day. They watch Days of Our Lives and soap operas and you know who's sleeping with whose neighbor and stuff like that. And, and then they even tape the program. Yeah? They tape the program so they can see it when they come home. This practice in Muslims, man. It's unbelievable, man. And so then you see it happening. Drugs. Al Khamar. Because intoxicants includes not only alcohol, it also includes drugs, the cocaine, the heroin, the crack, the LSD, al that which covers up your intelligence. All of this is in it, right inside of our book. So now let us look at a modern society. What happens on Friday night when a person wants to enjoy themselves? Where do they enjoy themselves? Where do they think they have to go to? The majority of the people say, well, first, my Friday, I got to get a drink. Let me get a drink first, okay? Let me take a smoke. I got to get ready now for the night. And then they're off for the night. How do you enjoy yourself? What are the places being built right here in Melbourne? Right, the Crown Casino. Where are people going to? Even here in Australia, down under. You have what? The second largest casino in the world. And you're down under. <laughs> what about the people who are up on the other side? <laughs> casino life. Gambling. And the gambling will destroy you. You see what it says here? Rijsun min amil shaitan. It is a filth. It is an abomination from the work of the devil. Stay away from it. But no, the roulette wheel. They play all the, the one-armed bandit, the dice, the cards, and they keep thinking, I'm going to win, I'll go back tomorrow, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, and the shaitan plays on their mind and destroys their families, destroys the society. But it's considered to be, okay, he's just enjoying himself, or he's just drunk. But what causes most of the accidents on the highway? Go to the, go to the transport authority right here in Australia and see over the Christmas vacation and the main holidays what causes most accidents on the highway and you'll probably find it is alcohol. It is people being intoxicated, toxic. You're being poisoned. It poisons the system, throws off your balance, changes your way of thinking. And so we find in this new world order that we become intoxicated, we are involved in gambling. No, I won't go to casino, I will go to the discotheque. 
I will go to rave, and I will rave all night. And we have a thing in Cape Town, I don't know whether you have it, they call it ecstasy. And they gave it to the young generation, ecstasy. They use all these names, right? Ecstasy, like you're really, you know, in some type of heaven. And they, 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 they give it to the younger generation, and he stays up all night, and he's raving around. And to catch the Muslims in Cape Town, they even made the rave center look like a masjid. On the side, it looks like Masjid al-Aqsa. On the front, it looks like the Blue Mosque in Turkey. And they had seven levels of rave. And even for the Muslims in Cape Town, and this is an advanced form of corruption, they said, no, um, when you're dancing, if you want to eat, they have halal food. <laughs> so you can have halal food. And you can still be a Muslim, you see? That's how it was tailor-made for us. And so, arousing passion, arousing this. Why do you think in these movies there's this terrible violence they are showing? And then always they, this erotica, this Greek concept now coming in where the body, people worship the body. The shape of the body being the most important thing. And the young woman feels she must show something from her body in order to be acceptable. She must expose her body even to her enemies. She exposes her body and thinks that she's modern or thinks that she's intelligent and she has self-esteem because she's exposing her inner parts even to her enemies. And up until now, with years of so-called women's liberation, they are still selling cars with beautiful girls. Lamborghini, the Porsche, they're still doing that exploiting the sexuality of women in order to sell products. And so we see it happening, we see it, and in the second, and in the last part of this verse, or, or, the, or in the last part of the categories, the Khamer and the Maser also shirk the polytheism, worshiping other gods, and fortune-telling. And people are involved in superstition and in fortune-telling, getting their palms read, going to people, to, 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 the, to the magic people, in order to get married, or in order to hurt somebody, or in order to be successful in business. Afraid of numbers, afraid of 11, afraid of 13, afraid of 666. And so fear is placed in the hearts. Superstition is placed in the hearts. And behind it, a lying deceiver. You think you're going to paradise. You think you're enjoying yourself, but the alcohol and intoxicants is killing your body. Lethal social diseases is cutting down your population. Gambling is ruining the family, ruining communities. But it's done in the name of progress and democracy and the 21st century. And the Quran also tells us that shaitan will say when the matter is decided. And this is a picture in Jehannam, in hell. When the people are down burning in hell, and they see the shaitan burning in hell, and they say, but you promised us. You promised us the promise of truth. And he said, I had no authority over you, but I called you and you came. I had no authority over you. And they really have no authority over us. But they call us, they put out the signals, they put out the advertisement, and we follow them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told to the shaitan and made it clear, well, Iyadu Billah, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan illa man ittaba'aka min al ghawin That surely amongst my slaves, my worshippers, you will have no authority over them except those who follow you from the evil doers. Except those who submit to you and submit to this system. And so we find ourselves Muslims and non-Muslims, people of conscience, people of goodness, who knew this world 30 or 40, 50 years ago, who knew their generations, knew their grandparents, and see the social fabric of society falling apart 
racism on the rise, murder being spread all throughout the planets, and then they are accusing Muslims. Why are they accusing us of this? Let's go to the bottom line. And what you have to realize, if behind all of these secret societies is the evil one, is the shaitan wa iyadu billah, then he will attack the holders of truth. That if you are talking and living the revelation, you become an enemy to the evil one. Well, iyadu billah. And so the reality is that we must never forget that Muslims must never forget that Islam is the real solution for this planet. We hold the solution in our hands. We hold it in our hearts. And we need to practice this now. Never forget who you are. Nobody cares if you just wear a kufi on your head. Or if you just say that your name is Ahmed. The biggest gangsters in Cape Town have Muslim names. The biggest gangsters. So nobody cares what your name is. But you have to realize that we have an interest-free economy. That if Allah blesses us with a state, we would establish a, a cooperative society which is not capitalism, it is not socialism. The banks will lend you money with no interest. It will be a cooperative system where if you have land and the bank gives you money, if your project succeeds, you both succeed. If your project fails, you both fail. Now, if you borrow money, if you fail, the bank wins and you fail. How many people know the, the, the pressure of living under a mortgage or a bond? It follows you all your life. Some people pay the bond for 20 years, hard labor, and then when they can't pay, their house is taken away from them. Some of them never live to see the fruits of their labor. It is burnt up in papers. And so an interest-free, cooperative society. And if our sheikhdoms, if our rich leaders would take their money out of these interest banks and put it into an Islamic economy, we would change the face of this earth. That, for many people, is the bottom line. But don't forget also that within our understanding is the true belief in one God, the true Tawheed, with no confusion, no human beings as God, no idols as God, no confusion about your Creator, but a way to communicate without a Pope, without a Bishop. Each individual can communicate, male or female, can communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also have strong families. We emphasize strong families, stay together. And Islam is telling us, and never forget, and try within your lifetime, that father and mother try to eat ch with your children. Establish your family so that the children are eating with their parents. Spend time, father, spend time with your children. Mother, spend time. Don't spend all your time chasing the dollar. Chasing something which will rise and fall in the twinkling of an eye. But we encourage the strong institution of the family. We also have a clear identity for male and female. And if we are practicing Islam, we should not be confused if we're a man or a woman. We shouldn't be confused. We also have a cure for racism that you don't look at the color of a person's skin. You don't base that, that, the judgment of that person, not on their color, not on their language, not on the texture of their hair, but it is taqwa. It is the piety, it is the God consciousness. That is how you should judge an individual. We also have a holistic science that would take us into an era of science whereby the scientists would think of the Creator. That in using technology, we would not be destroying life, but enhancing life, developing the earth, and not just developing plastics, and trying to make more money, 
with our science and technology. And we also have a khilafat, that we want to be ruled by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that the leader would be the one who would institute these laws, not from any special family, but the one who deserves to be the ruler of the people. And so, with a system that is so clear and honest and straightforward, why are we under attack? That is the job of deception. And the deception has come in this new globalization form, this, this now, this, this spread of technology, it is now shifted to us, trying to make us into an evil force. But never forget that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was called Majnoon, crazy. He was called Sahir, a magician. He was called a Kahin, a wizard. He was called Sha'ir, a poet. They used many names for him. They persecuted him. They tried to destroy his family. They tried to destroy the, his society. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Yuriduna li yutfi'u nur Allahi bi afwahihim. Wallahu mutimmu nuri. Wallahu kariha al kafirun. They want to put out the light of Allah with their mouths, with their information. But Allah will complete his light even though the disbelievers despise it. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give us basira in these times. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide our leaders, would guide our communities, would protect our families. May Allah protect the women and the children of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah give strength and protect the men of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah give the true vision of Islam to those who are not Muslim. May Allah take away the veils from their eyes and see that, that Islam is the real solution to the problems of this world. May Allah complete his light and we pray if possible, may Allah let us see a little bit of this light in our, in our lifetimes. If we cannot, then we ask you Allah to let our children see it and let the Muslims see victory and begin to see the light. And may Allah give us the best. If we cannot see it in this world, Give us the best in the hereafter. Have mercy upon us and enter us into paradise. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ri muslimin min kulli dham. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala khatim al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad. Alihi wa sahbi ajma'in wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, um, it is a great honor for me again to be with you. And um, I wanted to say at the outset that um, I do not consider myself to be a great mufti or a great uh, leader in Islam. Don't get confused. Um, but I am a brother who's been in the field. And so trying to, to give off some of um, the, you know, the experiences and you know, the, the, the small amount of knowledge that Allah has blessed me with. And um, whatever mistakes I make are from myself. And if you gain anything, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, the questions um, you have asked are very deep questions. And um, I pray that Allah would raise up for this ummah that type of leadership um, that can really get us, you know, out of the situation that we are in. Because um, this is one of the greatest crises that Ummah has been in in a long time. And, um, but I believe that you know, with questions such as this, and with young brothers and sisters uh, such as yourselves, uh, um, striving for the deen, even so far away from the Muslim world, that there is great hope uh, for the future. Also part of the hope for the future, I want to share with you with a special um, event that will be happening at the end when I finish the questions. Uh, which I believe is part of the hope uh, for the future of this Ummah. Concerning the questions, uh, one says, how do you deal with the deception that women who cover uh, won't be successful? Now, um, again, this materialistic secularism, or some people who call secular humanism, uh, which has swept the planet. And, and in Europe, um, when the Catholic Church became very oppressive, and stunted the growth uh, of scientists and people who were uh, studying the natural phenomena. 
there was a reaction. And so you found that many of the educated people became atheists, or they were against the church because the church was in a very progress uh, negative, uh, repressive type of position. But this never happened in the world of Islam. And so, um, although it happened in Europe, that thinking was, was transported all over the planet. Um, and concerning the Muslim world, it is out of place. Because if a person is, is more religious in Islam, the more knowledge they have is the more balanced they should actually become. Not extremist. They should become balanced. And the more they, they should be capable of dealing with science and dealing with uh, uh, math, and learning alongside with their religious belief. So it is a different thing that happened in the Muslim world. Our problem was um, tyrannical rulers and greed, um, tribalism. This did happen to us. But um, our way of life does support uh, progress. It supports um, a person working. It supports a healthy family. So when a sister is covering up, if a brother is growing his beard or making salat, um, this does not make the person, uh, you know, uh, anti-civilization. Or, or this does not necessarily mean the person is finished now and, and, and he is a misfit. It actually shows that that person is now submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that Allah will, would give success to that individual and bless that individual uh, either in this life or the hereafter. Um, one uh, sister is saying, what is your advice to me? Uh, sometimes when I'm in a room uh, of sisters, I feel that love is being, that love shown is, is fake. That people are just saying things, you know, and they don't really mean it. And what can we do to really strengthen our hearts? Um, it is important for our, our gatherings not only to be social gatherings, and especially for the sisters, but that the gatherings should be gatherings of the remembrance of Allah where we study the book of Allah, we study the sunnah of the Prophet and where we come together. This is where the angels you know, surround us when we are in our gathering. So even though sisters are not male, it is not an Islam, it's not Islamic to say that the men are the ones who study, the, men's are the men are the ones who focus on religious things, and the women are the dunya. This is a concept and some, a mistaken concept, that the men are the deen and the women are the dunya, meaning the world. So they should be talking about how many bangles you have on and how rich is your husband and how to cook this kind of food. No. Sisters should also come together to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, to recite his book um, and, and, and to be involved in, you know, Islamic practices, spiritual uh, matters as well, and also to be involved in Islamic work. So when you're involved in this wholesome Islamic work and the remembrance of Allah, then this can help for the sincerity of the hearts. In the same way it helps the brothers when they come together, it can also help the sisters. Another question is, it says, a few influential Muslims say that the first bond or mortgage is halal. And they have this uh, in what some sheikhs have said, they say that it is correct. Um, I'm not a mufti to be able to give you ultimate decisions. But, you know, what is haram is haram. And the person who's going to make something uh, halal that is haram has got to bring some solid delil, some solid proof to make haram uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, so to make a halal what Allah has made haram. And the only case that I uh, have been taught, that the or one of the only cases that the scholars you know, allow something like this is darora. It is an emergency. Ad-dururat to bi al mahdurat That those things that are out of necessity, dire necessity, can make something halal when it is normally not permissible. Okay, so a person starving to death, they could eat a piece of pork, okay, to, to, in order to save their life. And so if a person was in that situation, then um, they would be able to take the mortgage. But in most cases, in 99% of the cases, you know, we are getting it only, it's really just to have a bigger house, or to have more rooms, or to say, I own the house. But you can't take it with you to your grave anyway. You can't take it there. And so um, whether we own things or we, or we not, Allah knows best because nobody can take anything you know, to, the, uh, to the grave. And if we are taking sins with us to the grave, we are better off to submit to Allah than um, uh, submit to the material world. Next it says, what do, you think, uh, uh, what, do you, uh, what do you think a teenager should do in their lives 
in order to be a good Muslim and prevent themselves from falling into deception. Well, um, this, this age of being a teenager, which is supposed to be between childhood and adulthood, this really is a Western construct. We do not have this in Islam. Um, and some people say, well, they're a teenager, so they're confused and they don't know who they are. They don't know if they're an adult. They feel adult feelings, but they're still a child. Um, yes, there is childhood and you are young, but we believe that once you become mukallaf, that, that once you reach puberty, that you should begin to take responsibility. You don't have to be 21 to take responsibility. Usama bin Zaid, radiallahu anhumah, was the general of an army. Or was a, uh, he was appointed by the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi he was only like 16, 17 years old. And in that army was Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhumah. So even though he's a 16 year old, this is a lost teenager, right? 16. But so, so that concept doesn't e exist amongst us. And young people should really see themselves as responsible people. Because what you're doing, once you become mature, the angels are writing on you. Just like they're writing on adults. So we need to come out of this thing about being lost. And really, young people can add a lot to the leadership of the Ummah uh, uh, and to the future of our community. It says here that um, if your husband bought a house on interest in Jahiliya, and now you are all, uh, as a family, obeying Allah and repenting, um, should you sell the house? Well, you know, um, those things that you have done in the past, you know, if, if a person has done things in the past and, and comes into Islam, uh, Allah forgives those sins, you know, uh, that, that the person committed in, in the previous uh, life in the time of Jahiliyyah. And there may be varying uh, opinions about this. It is better, you know, for a person to clear themselves totally as their tawbah. Radd uh, al that they give back, uh, you know, that they make compensation for all of the things. So they would be better off to do that. But you're not uh, uh, commanded to throw yourself into haraj, to throw yourself into a confusion, uh, into an economic confusion right away when you accept Islam. You should try to gradually come out of this. And if you can gradually, inshallah, move to the point, you know, where you can uh, sell the house or get rid of the house, then you actually would be better off uh, in the future. Another question says, um, a young East African brother was killed about two nights ago, and I would like to advise all of the young brothers to stop hanging on the streets. This is some very good advice from a sister uh, to the brothers. And um, if a brother is hanging on the streets, as they say, and you're standing at the, 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 the street corners, there is haq. The street has its rights upon you. One is that if the Muslims are passing you, you have to give salams to people. Okay, and there's a few of them. What I recall from them is that um, you know you're supposed to enjoin what is good al amr bil maruf wa nahi al munkar. So if you're standing on the corner and you see evil, you're supposed to change it, man. Okay, you're not supposed to stand there. So if you see that you're on the corner and, and, and they're making deals and drugs and whatnot, you're supposed to move on him, man. You're supposed to change. If you can't do it, don't hang on the corner because the corner has certain rights. Uh, that are involved in the shaitan in this modern constructs that we have, especially downtown. This is where the real evil is coming about on many of these street corners uh, type of things. Idle time, when people don't have anything to do. And there's so much that we have to learn, there's so much exploring we have to do of this world that we don't have time just to be sitting around and, and, and to be wasting our time. Another question says, I have two small children, how do I make them strong enough to face the society and the future. Um, Alhamdulillah, they are very small at this point, but your terbiyah, your Islamic education begins for the child even when they're very young. And so the child is watching, and so we always make sure they are eating halal, that we are you know, covering ourselves, that we are doing what is right, we are being kind you know, to our children, and, and we, we establish the salat in front of them, we let them see us making salat, you know, they can even fast when they're very, very young. And even some children, you know, in our household, they might fast for 15 minutes just before iftar, right? But at least they fasted. And they felt that they fasted, and then they came to the iftar and they made their iftar, okay? So, so at least, you know, get them used to doing Islamic things even before it is the time. The young girls, get the young girl used to uh, wearing, uh, uh, you know, loose clothes and wearing the khimar, the scarf, even before she's mukallaf. She can start to do that early. The brother can start also taking responsibility 
in the Salat, calling the Adhan, establishing the Salat, even before he's Mukallaf. So we need, once we plant that foundation and we focus on Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, from the very young ages, inshallah, when we make dua for them, yeah, that, that, that Allah would guide them uh, in the future. Another question is, how do I know if a brother is serious about marriage and not playing around? If he is not serious, do I discontinue talking to him? Okay. Um, really, when it comes to you know, social matters and whatnot, um, the, the brothers and sisters really shouldn't be talking to each other um, unless they're in the same family. You know, if there is some business, and this came to the Muslim Student Associations, this question was asked, and if there is a, a male who says to the female, you know, what is the homework assignment? And then you, you answer. You say, you know, page 147. But if he says to you, where are you doing your homework? That's another level now. You see, that's another level. He's prying into your personal life. Okay? So if the person is prying into your personal life, whether you're male or female, that's when you stop. Then you want to know the intentions of the person. And, you know, if the brother is serious, you, you, the only the way that we can judge people is by, you know, their, their, their practices. Time for salat, he establishes salat. He's serious about his fasting. He has dhikrullah on his lips. He's remembering Allah. You will hear it in his, in, 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 in his, in his way. Okay? And also, one of the things that, that has happened uh, is that, you know, let your wali talk to him. Don't go off by yourself. The male and female should not be alone because the third party is the shaitan. Remember the, the, the deception of the shaitan? That's one of the places. If you go alone, shaitan is the third party. Also, if you do things too fast, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ajala min as shaitan That going too fast comes from the devil. And so it happens, the brother sees a sister, he said, Sister, no, uh, it's sunnah, we must get married right, you know, now, immediately, it's sunnah. So one sister came to me and said, I want to marry the brother, he has a nice curl in his hair and he can read the Quran. And he said, it's sunnah. I said, okay, where does he come from? Where is his family? Where does he work? What is his past? You have to ask these questions. Or your wali should be involved. You don't make a decision by yourself and just do everything real fast. No, take your time and go through the process of marriage, you know, where you check the person out. You have a third party check the person out, right? The wali should be involved, right? Make your istikhara properly, asking Allah to make the right choice. Right? Then make your decision. Don't do it quickly because this is really the deception of the shaitan and don't be by yourself unless you are from the same family or mahram. Another question is that she said, I love a, a boy um, but he's not from my clan and I'm, I'm scared, I'm afraid that the families and his family you know, would uh, refuse and uh, um, you know, what should I do? And, um, this is really a terrible situation. And when I served as the Imam in the Masjid in Toronto, we had this situation really, really serious. It was happening in India, from India and Pakistan, you know, different tribes in India and Pakistan, what are you, Muhajir, Kashmiri, you know, Patan, you know, which part you come from. And some people even said, like, which part of the village did you come from? Do you come from the hill or down by the river? <laughs> which side of the river? You know, and then, you know, the mosque that I was in had many Somali brothers and sisters and only two Somalis. And then in Toronto, my mosque was the biggest Somali jamaat in the whole of the city. It's Toronto, right? 40,000 uh, Somalis, alhamdulillah, came to our city. And then I began to know uh, uh, Darod, Hawiya, Ishaq, Midigan, all the tribes. This is a special joke for the Somalis, right? It's a special joke. Then I even began to know now listen to this, for our Somali brothers and sisters, and everybody else has got to know this. I even, a sister came to me and she said, a beautiful sister, and she said, I wanted to get married and the family refused me. And I said, why? She said, we are the Midigan. The Midigan. Okay? And this is a, a, a tribe, right, or a grouping of people who were probably the Swahili people along the coastline. They were silversmiths and merchants, right? And when the nomadic people came in, there was a struggle that went on, and it turned into a myth or a superstition. You know, where, I don't want to go into details, but in Ishaq and Darod and Hawiya, 
and they began, they were traveling along and the food ran out and there was only a dead ostrich. So the Midigan ate from that and they cursed him to the day of judgment. Okay, this is one of the stories concerning it. It's tribalism and it's confusion and has nothing to do with Islam. And, 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 and the Somali nation, which is one of our important nations, one of the first nations to come into Islam, we know even from the Hijrah to Habasha, right? One of the important nations has been struck with tribalism to the point where it is causing confusion. And it is a disease and we have to struggle against it. And I know people have died, but we have to accept each other on taqwa. That has to be the main thing. And not upon superstition or tribalistic myths. And I say this with all respect, you know, to the clans and to the tribes. That, you know, this is the true ummah when we break this down. Because we need to even go from clan and tribe and we can marry another race. Another race of people. That's what Islam is really about. So all of us have to struggle with a type of tribalism and nationalism you know, in ourselves. And our advice is get one of the ulama, you know, maybe from the same clan, who has the knowledge of Islam and taqwa, and let him talk to the family. Let him talk to the mother and to the father and to reason with them and to show them the Islamic position over the tribal position. Okay, and, 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 and encourage properly. Don't run away. You run away without the wali and without the family, that's not the, the, the best way to solve this problem. But go to the mother, to the father, bring an alim with you, you know, a respected person, and let him reason with the family to the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have seen this work in Toronto, in our community. We have seen the clans marry each other and come together uh, uh, on Islamic issues. And, th and this is important for all of our people, uh, no matter what tribe or nation uh, they belong to. Another question which is concerning the Somali community as well, but it also in includes the Yemenis and other people. And it is talking about, it's saying my people of my community are claiming that Qat or Jat or Mira or whatever you want to call it, they say it is halal. Okay, and they say it's permissible. What can you tell us about this? We did a study about this. For the brothers who don't know and sisters who don't know, there is a plant that may have been originally from Ethiopia, cultured in Yemen, it grows in Kenya as well. There's the Mira uh, version coming out of Kenya. And um, the, the plant is chewed. And then you drink liquids and then you, you swallow the liquid. And it has an effect upon your body. And um, uh, it was studied by scientists and it was shown that it is a drug. And it, it, it is addictive and it also has an effect upon the body. It ruins your teeth, your gums. It also ruins your digestive system. It also makes you, the bones of your children become very weak. The person who chews the daqat, he stays up for 35 hours. And they're in the medjulis and they're talking and then whatever. And sometimes from that they even smoke some uh, marijuana or they do something else inside this. Okay? And it, it has had a destructive effect upon the Muslims. To the point now in parts of Yemen, you know, after Zuhr, the whole society is chewing qat. I mean, if somebody wanted to attack them, if they attacked after Zohar, you know, they'd probably say, okay, take the country, man, let me chew. <laughs> right? They'd probably let them chew. So, this is a, a drug, man. It's a drug. It is not the same, it's not as lethal as cocaine or heroin, but it's been proven to be an addictive drug, and it is a waste of money, right? It is not helping us. Some people say, oh, no, 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 we chew for ibadah. We chew to make tahajjud. Right? How many people are chewing cotton and making tahajjud? Right? You, you go to the medjus and see how many make, are making tahajjud prayer. Okay? Then they came and the mothers came and they said, um, they take the milk from the babies and they buy the, the cot. They take milk from the baby's mouth. Okay? And it's, and it's reached the point of even gangsterism, mafia gangsterism coming in. So we need to come away from all these drugs so we are only dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should not be dependent upon any of these chemicals or drugs because it is a form of substance abuse. And there was a fatwa made by the, uh, the Muslim, by, by the scholars of Medina. There was a conference held in Medina where the scholars came together and they made a judgment on this. They studied it from a chemical point of view, a, a, a psychological, physical, and they came to the conclusion that it is haram, that it is, it is not permissible uh, to be involved uh, in that. Um, 
Okay, now coming to some of the other questions. It says, um, it says, um, uh, what do you suggest us, young Muslims, uh, what knowledge is best for us to start with, um, to become knowledgeable uh, of Islam? And what about Islam in South Africa? Uh, in terms of the knowledges, you, know, you should try to form, you know, follow a classical form of education. And you know, we should try to learn the Arabic language, also from a young age, to memorize the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then to begin to learn proper grammar, to speak Arabic in a proper way, to be able to read the texts, and then to go to different texts. If you cannot get to that, you know, along with our reading tafsir and reading hadith, we also recommend asira to nabawiyah that you read the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and also you should have a proper understanding of Aqidah or Iman. What, are, what is the proper principles of Iman? Right? And what is the true Iman uh, of a believer? These are very crucial issues uh, in these times. Then you can go on to other types of history and other things, but you, you want a solid foundation in Quran and Sunnah and the principles of Iman uh, and then also um, Asira to Nabawiyah uh, to give you more perspective. In terms of uh, the da'wah in South Africa, and Islam in South Africa, alhamdulillah, uh, the da'wah is going on very strong, and uh, we are now penetrating uh, some of the African townships uh, in, in the, in the far-out areas. Um, also, the universities, the schools, there's a, a steady da'wah program that is going on, and, and it is spreading. It's, it's very difficult in South Africa because apartheid thinking uh, separated people, white, colored, African, they separated people based upon color. And it had a heavy impact upon the, the, the minds and psyches uh, of all of the people of the nation. But alhamdulillah, now people of all colors are coming together and breaking down racial barriers. It is starting to happen. And um, we pray that um, those in authority you know, can begin to share the wealth right, and open up the educational systems so that there would not be uh, a violent uh, 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 you know, overthrow in the country because you know, it would be terrible bloodshed and we do not want to have uh, bloodshed. And those things done by Nelson Mandela and many of his people, you know, they made some very strong efforts. Um, and we believe that Islam can provide uh, many of the solutions um, that the society needs. Uh, but it's only for the Muslims now to be able to live Islam and then take the message to those who have not heard it. It says regarding the, the Ummah leader, leadership, um, what are the scholars uh, are doing uh, in this Ummah? Well, um, you know, we don't always get the news of all of the scholars. Unfortunately, we don't have access to information. And there are many scholars, alhamdulillah, in many parts of the Muslim world who are taking strong stands for the deen. Um, you're not going to hear a lot of this information unless you go to the areas, unless you know the people. But alhamdulillah, there is still you know, strong Muslims, and we believe, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that there is Ta'ifatun Mansura, that there is a victorious party, um, and they are standing. Uh, and, and this has not been knocked down. S you know, there are still strong scholars, and there are still people who are standing, and we believe it is only a matter of time. And even though you see depressive things on the television, you know, in many cases it's different on the ground. And there are more people now making Salat, coming back into the deen, than we have known in the past 100 years or so, or even more. Inshallah, this is Bushra for us and the younger generation, and there are more people who are also coming into Islam than we've seen in a long time. Um, it says also, um, there are many good Muslims around the world. Uh, why don't the Muslims establish one leader or Khalifa uh, for the believers to follow an Islamic law? Okay, um, it is the hope and it is the prayer that we move towards, you know, a central leader who would be the Khalifa. But this is a process. It's a process. You cannot take a person right now out of the blue and say, this is the leader of the whole Muslim world. It's not going to work, man. Because people are divided in, in tribal lines and even organizational lines. So it is a consciousness that we need to work on as an ummah, to, you know, to develop, to come toward the point where we can bring back that type of central leadership um, that we had in the past. And, and, and more and more people realize the importance of that leadership, which is not a secular leadership, but one that is working uh, based upon the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu You know, there, there is some questions. I mean, no doubt there's questions concerning music. And this is a very controversial area. 
But what I would like to say is that although music has been used as a negative thing um, in, to control people's emotions, there is also forms of nasheed. There are forms of Islamic chants which if done properly with the proper wording and you know what not can actually um, make people feel good and boost them. And I've seen people who are involved in struggle in Palestine and other areas and, and they are singing you know these chants and, and, and you know, it really lifts you you know when you hear these chants you know being done. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. You know and the people uh, sang Tala al Beddu Alayna for the Prophet Sallallahu when he came to Medina. Uh, we have to be very cautious when we're dealing in this area because shaitan is so powerful in, in the music industry. But the solution is not to say there is nothing, there is no form of music uh, which is permissible. There are forms that are permissible. And, and, and we need to try to struggle to find these forms. Brother Yusuf Islam you know, is one of the people who's trying to move in that area and, and to get things that are acceptable in Sharia you know, that can boost the feelings of the Muslims and still keep them, um, you know, in the halal, you know, type of realm. So we need to be balanced when we deal with some of these issues. It says, why Muslims don't go into the, to achieve information technology? Why are we being left behind? Actually, you know, Muslims are some of the best uh, computer technologists in the world. If you go to Silicon Valley, I, I've had the opportunity to lecture and be amongst the Muslims in Silicon Valley, and you'd be surprised at some of the top uh, information technology experts are Muslims. And even in India itself, many of them are Muslims, you know, who are in, in the leading part. The problem is we don't control our technology. Our money is being used by our governments for the wrong purposes, to build nice palaces and drive big cars and have houses all over the world and whatever. Instead of using the money properly, we have the, 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 the talent, we do have the talent, but we're not controlling our own technology. And that's the point we need to come to, where we are self-sufficient and then control our own technology to be able to you know, speak the truth about Islam. Uh, one brother is saying, I want to get married, but there is not a religious woman that I can find, especially in this country. Okay, and um, if I get married you know, to a woman, if I can't find one, can I marry a non-Muslim or a, a something like that? Okay, brother, you have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually what I have found, I can't talk about Melbourne, but I have found from traveling around, I'm going to be very honest with you, that the majority of people in the communities that I go into who are serious about Islam are women. The majority of the people. The majority of the people who are accepting Islam in South Africa. I was just in Stockholm, Sweden, just uh, two months ago. In Sweden, all over Scandinavia. The majority of people accepting Islam are women. The majority of, of the students in the Muslim student associations who are serious and organizing are women. This is the reality. Go to the madrasas. If sisters are given a chance, they become the best students in the madrasa. Man. So I don't know what you're talking about. For us, it's the opposite. We have sisters who can't find a good brother. <laughs> so really, you should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you know, take the proper steps. We cannot leave our faith. You, you cannot marry uh, uh, you know, non-Muslim uh, uh, people like that going outside of your sharia. You know, you should stay within the sharia and, 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 and make pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. And, you know, and if you can't get married right, right away, alaykum bisawm. You should fast, man. Take some time fasting and, 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 and you know, may Allah make it easy for you and bring you uh, uh, that Muslim woman. But you know, sometimes we look at the others, we say, well, I want Aisha, right? Or you, you want Fatima, but are you Ali? <laughs> right? But you want Fatima, right? Right, but are you, are you on the level of being Ali? Radiallahu anhu. Okay? You got to get yourself really on that level before you can expect, you know, to receive uh, uh, Fatima. Radiallahu anhu. What is the best way uh, to, sell, to tell somebody to stop taking drugs um, if they are addicted? Well, you have to realize that the addiction is psychological and it's physical. Okay, there's different levels within the addiction itself. And you need to talk to somebody or, or, or to talk with people who have experienced the drugs before. Okay, because, you know, if you haven't experienced it, then you cannot necessarily feel sometimes what that person is feeling. At the same time, you'll find in most of the drug rehabilitation programs that there is spirituality. Even the non-Muslims have spirituality. Because it is re really through spirituality that you can really defeat this um, monster that's on your back. This chemical which is trying to destroy your life. 
And so you have to remind that person of the Creator and of Allah's mercy upon them. And you know, show them the ways of the Sunnah. If they start practicing the, the Sunnah in their eating, in their habits, you know, this can help them then you know, to, to fight off this chemical. And then you should go to a, an expert, a doctor, to help them deal with the physical side. Because there's a physical side that they have to deal with. We call it cold turkey. Right? So you, 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 know, you have to go through this pain and whatnot to get the chemical uh, uh, out of your body. And then it's important to provide um, activities so the person does not go back to their friends or go back to the same, same street corner that they were on um, when they were involved in the addictive drugs. Okay? Uh, another question is saying, I would like to know how can we work, okay, this is about the, the, the Khalifa. You know, they want to know how to work for the Khalifa. We need to practice our Islam and to strengthen our jamaats. You strengthen your communities, we strengthen you know, our consciousness, our understanding, and then and, and, and we keep praying for this and, 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 and talking about it and, and, and supporting people who are moving toward leadership, proper leadership, and eventually this will come. But it's a process. You can't put somebody in that position right away. If you put them in front of the Muslims, now the Muslims would kill them. Okay, because they're too tribalistic, man. Organizational fanaticism. So it's a process we have to go through in, in order to have uh, the proper leadership over our ummah. Also, there's a question saying that um, I have a weakness in my heart as a corruption, like an evil hurting this person. And, you know, the person should, there's a few du'as that the Prophet ﷺ used to say, especially in the morning after Fajr and in the evening. And um, these are important in these times of evil with deception. And one of them is, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. And especially you're entering into a new place, uh, a new area. And, and some of the scholars have said this one should be read a lot in these times. أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. You're seeking refuge in the complete words of Allah from the evil He has created. Okay, because this evil and deception is around us. بسم الله الذي لا يضر ما اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو السميع البصير. That you're saying in the name of Allah that nothing in this in this world uh, can harm you, um, and Allah sees all things and He knows all things. Also, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you see evil, then you should say Allahumma لا يأتي بالحسنات إلا أنت ولا يدفع السيئات إلا أنت ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك. O oh Allah. Nobody can come with good but you, and nobody can protect us from evil but you. And there is no authority and no power except with you. Also, in these times, we are encouraged by many of the scholars to say often, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. And this is what comes in the Quran that when, and you see in the battle after the battle of Uhud, when um, the, 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 the mushrikeen you know, were terrorizing the Muslims, and it came that they were a big crowd was coming, then Allah told the Prophet ﷺ that they should say, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. That Allah is the one who will take us to account. He is the best to protect. And so we need to say this thing often in our hearts, to strengthen our hearts with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, 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 you know, from the evil and deception that is around us. Um, another question is, um, why didn't Allah destroy Iblis? Okay, this is a question probably by a younger Muslim. And, uh, but it is, it is a question, and you know, why Allah knows why. I mean, we can't know why Allah does things. We do know that there is, there is tests in this world, you know, that there, there is good and there is evil, and that, and that we are judged upon, you know, the choices, our intentions, and our choices. But we cannot question the Creator, or to know the why these things have happened, but um, to try to submit. A Muslim is one who submits to the will of Allah. And we know that there's evil and there's good, and we try to be on the side of good. Okay, and pray that one day, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give us the knowledge uh, of the unseen. Um, it says, like you said, what we, what we will never heard of, okay, uh, what should we do when the shaitan whispers bad things? If this waswisa, the, the waswisa of the shaitan can come to an individual, and it is said you should make ista'adha min shaitan A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Okay, make isti'adha, and even sometimes you're allowed to spit lightly over the left shoulder. Okay, and you know, constantly, you know, with the remembrance of Allah, it clears the air. 
You know, so if we're constantly remembering Allah, not just in Salat, you say Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, A'udhu Billah, in all different ways, keep remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much during the day. Instead of today, people are swearing all the time. If they swear and say foul, filthy, nedges things in their mouth, right, then that brings the evil, because the evil loves filth. Right, so if, if, we're, if we're eating halal food, if we're saying good things, if we're making our prayers, you know, then we're protected you know, to a great extent from the waswisa. If it keeps coming, then, then we continue to make these du'as, uh, and, and, there are, and, and there are some others, but the three that I read are good, and read Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, uh, Ayat Al-Kursi, uh, and these different uh, 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 ayat and, and in the Qur'an. Uh, another question, uh, it's a little bit off the topic, it says you mentioned Christopher Columbus's son, uh, that he saw these communities and buildings and um, were, the, were the natives or Muslims, uh, you know, were the natives Muslims and who discovered America? There's a, there's a tape that I have out there in a book, I don't know if anything's left, it's called uh, Deeper Roots and that gives you the um, detailed history with documentation about the, the presence of Muslims in the Americas before Columbus. It is documented that they went from the shores of Andalusia, the shores of Spain and Portugal and North Africa, and they used the currents, and they went across Al Mas'udi, the famous writer, Al Idrisi, Al Umari, Ibn Qutiyya, and a number of famous scholars documented the journeys of these uh, uh, seafarers that went into the Atlantic Ocean and found land and mixed with the people, and some of them actually came back. Al Mas'udi writes that they came back. And everybody in Spain knew about these people. So, and there is documentation in the Americas about the presence of Muslims also that is now coming to the surface from the native people uh, and from the African Americans uh, within America. So some of that information is available uh, in the text that we have. Now, concerning um, the one government, and, and this is another issue that we are coming to, uh, concerning the one government, uh, and Allah knows best, it seems to be moving toward something that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said would come, and that is the time of the Antichrist. That is the time of, of, of a Dajjal, the Antichrist, who would come and would be a one-eyed person, his right eye would be blinded and popped out like a grape, and he would fill the earth with fitna and temptation and confusion. And so um, um, this fits right in with the one world leader, the one world government that we are all being programmed uh, towards. It's a natural process within our scriptures and our literature that is coming about and the leader that they're probably going to put on top you know Allah knows best would be Dajjal or the forerunner uh, for the Dajjal you know who is coming in at the same time um, there is there are some authentic hadiths concerning the Mahdi and that is the promised one the one who would come and lead the Muslim world um, and he would be from the, the family of the Prophet uh, his name is Muhammad, his father's name is Abdullah, his mother's name is Amina. He is from the Prophet's family, he has a high forehead and an aquiline, a high bridge nose. And, he, and um, he will fill the earth with justice after it was filled with oppression and with uh, 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 killing and murder. And so um, there, is, there are authentic traditions and the scholars have documented uh, this about the Mahdi. There have been many people who claim to be the Mahdi, but they were not on the path, they made false claims. We found it in early times coming out. One of the Abbasid uh, uh, Khalifas was called Mahdi. You find a Mahdi was in the Sudan who claimed he was the Mahdi. Um, there were others, we used to have Mahdi's in New York City every other month. Um, you know, so you have a lot of people who made this claim to be um, this righteous one you know, who's coming up. But um, this is a person who's coming right by the end of time. There are some scholars who claim that he's alive and you know, next year at Hajj or the following year, he's going to appear. Okay, Allah who a'lam, Allah knows best. And in the past, they have made these claims, and the claims have not come true. Only Allah knows when the actual time will come. But we do pray that Allah would bring somebody like this, you know, as soon as possible. We could use the Mahdi right now, actually, um, to help us out of some of the confusion that we're facing in the Muslim world. But don't be fooled. Right? Because the Mahdi is, it will be, you know, fi layla. In the Hadith, it said Allah will raise him up in one night. So if somebody comes to you claiming he is the Mahdi, or the Mahdi is around the corner, watch out. 
because that is part of the deception of the shaitan with iyadu billah even to the point where there was a novel there was a book that was put out it was a fiction but they, it, it could even be tried where it said that the intelligence agencies actually um, had a false person they set him as the leader and they put him on an Arafat and then using a satellite they beam the light down to Arafat on his face and he said I am the Mahdi right and he's gonna lead all the people they even wrote a, a, a book fiction uh, about this okay so um, we don't believe any of these things but we should have patience and wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring about uh, 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 the final signs of the last days the other question is concerning um, how can we break free from the deception what should we do in the face of this new world order uh, inshallah this will be the um, basis of the talk uh, tomorrow to try to give some suggestions and if Allah gives life we pray inshallah we'll be able to discuss this together and that this would be um, something that you know is a door that's opening up these are not the final bits of information it is a door that is really opening up and now alhamdulillah uh, we want to um, you know give you something of a, a blessing that has come to us uh, with our friend Victor and our brother Amir come forward too please one of the hopes of this ummah is the fact that good people are still accepting Islam and alhamdulillah our, our brother Victor uh, with the help of our brother Amir you know uh, has had the feeling to accept Islam and Allah blessed him in this occasion with your presence right not just mine your vibes and your presence that Victor now has the feeling Alhamdulillah our brother is from Argentina Alhamdulillah so you know even the, the, the new world the World Cup we have the winner of the World Cup <laughs> right here, whether Argentina wins or not inshallah and so um, our brother inshallah is ready to take his shahada and you know we want to very you know uh, to, to enjoy this uh, with him raise your right hand though. Ashhadu Ashhadu An la An la Ilaha Ilaha Illallah Illallah Wa Ashhadu Ashhadu Anna Anna Muhammadan Muhammadan Abduhu Abduhu Wa Wa Rasulu Rasulu Sallallahu Sallallahu Alayhi Alayhi Wasallam Wasallam I bear witness I bear witness There is nothing worthy of worship There is nothing wor worthy of worship Except Allah Except Allah And I bear witness And I bear witness That Muhammad Muhammad is his servant, is his servant and last message. And last message. Peace, be upon him. Peace be upon him. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. So we pray that inshallah that Allah guides our brother. And um, he is now the cleanest person in, in this audience right now. Because the Prophet said that when a person takes the shahada, all of the previous sins uh, you know, have been forgiven. So we ask you to make dua for us especially for me and all my sins. Um, so make dua for us, inshallah. And may Allah guide you uh, and, and give you the best in this life and the next.